try to Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, really difficult, Elena. Thanks a lot for doing that presentation and, and making me almost cry um, the minute before I'm supposed to start my session, doggone it. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, obviously. And uh, what I want to do, though, is try to explain to you that uh, this has been a journey and a path that I've been on for a long time, as Michelle well knows. I think she's in our room uh, today taking in what's going on during our virtual presentations. But to me, there's a difference between Dabrowski and theory, which I know many of my colleagues have been dabbling with and, and digging into over the years and living a developmental life. And I've placed myself in a space that is more focusing on that developmental life aspect, uh, which is why uh, many of you out there don't know who I am and are thinking, well, who is this guy and, and what's his background? And uh, I, I try to look at some publications, but there doesn't seem to be a ton of stuff out there. And that's been purposeful on my part. Um, I did what I needed to do being an academic in higher education during tenure and promotion. And after that, I was freed to do what I want to do. And what I want to do has been pretty instrumental in my development over time. And I'm going to get into that as the presentation goes on. I'll share tidbits along the way. Uh, those of you that go ahead, that downloaded my presentation said, of course, between the time I uploaded it and today, it's changed a bit. But the vast majority of it is the same. And I know a lot of people are, are concerned and said, oh, don't read ahead. I don't care if you read ahead because most of it is pictures. I use a lot of visuals and rely on the presentation that I'm going to do uh, to fill in the bits and pieces. And then I'm going to try to leave uh, time at the very end uh, for questions. And I hope we can get into a discussion more than just uh, me sitting back waiting for questions. And then going from there, I want to ask some of some of you, uh, some of your insights, and, and we'll pick it up and go from there. And the, the best version of uh, synchronous work rather than asynchronous. So the idea of living a developmental life, uh, I've learned over the years, it's all about E. And I believe Dabrowski would validate that very much. So the complexity of treating EOEs as a nebula, as I call it, and not separate measurable slide scales is finally being recognized and that gives me great hope. Uh, this is something I've felt intuitively for a long, long time that these OEs are not on a sliding scale and we can't measure each one of them individually um, and build it from there. And, I, and I'm not dissing anybody's work. Um, if you take a look at Frank Falk, <laughs> there, there's a, a, a connectedness here. Frank was my first psychology professor at the University of Akron when I was starting off as a chemical engineer. Uh, so uh, when they, when he and Nancy were testing the OEQ, the original, I was one of the original test subjects in uh, our Psych 101 courses. So I've unwittingly been attached to this field for a long, long time. And, and I'll come back around the barn with that a little bit further. But to me, the emotional OE is the linchpin that everything else comes from. And you've heard over the last few days, many people leading toward that. And actually, um, Bill actually posted that up, I think, in a couple of discussion uh, blogs as we were going on in presentation. So it's, to me, that's very heartening to hear that. Now, where do I come to this field from? Well, some of my, uh, and I want to recognize the elders uh, who have come before me that I stand on their shoulders, obviously. Sharon Lind is one. George Betts is another. Uh, my gifted grandmother, Anna Marie Roper, who through the years, when I first started into the field back in 1995, 1996, I, I speak German. And at every NAGC conference, Anna Marie and I would sit down for coffee and have a conversation in German, which I think was uh, pretty um, problematic for the people around us who were wondering, it's like, look at this grandma lady talking to this guy and they're speaking in a foreign language. This is the NAGC conference. Why aren't, why aren't they talking in English? And we did hear people say that. We kind of chuckled about it. Um, but Anna Marie and I had several long discussions about what I'm going to present in different ways. And her encouragement over the years uh, has been just palpable in, in how I've developed as a person. Uh, through some of that work, uh, I dug into her husband's journey and pathway uh, 
as an intellectual and not necessarily an academic. He put everything into practice. So being the Roper School, the principal of the Roper School and working in a very selfless way for the children and the families. My personal opinion is uh, Anna Marie did a lot of the publishing because George didn't. And he pushed her forward into that space. But the work that I've done through looking through the archives, it's they're a team, they always have been a team, uh, but George really planted the seeds and then watered the garden and Anna Marie picked it up and ran with it. And he was happy to sit in the background. Uh, and I didn't know the man personally, but another person I wanna recognize is my best friend, Jim Delisle, who started off as my dissertation advisor. And uh, that relationship has developed into something very special between the two of us. Jim did know George Roper and uh, as I was constantly needling Jim about, well, what was George like? And you know, what was it? he would sit and smile and just share little tidbits and let me come to my own understandings and discoveries, which is great. The list goes on and on and on. Um, many of the people at this conference, and and I did needle Michelle on day one, um, Chris, when we were listening to you in that first keynote, uh, I sent a text and zipped it off to Michelle right away and said, like, oh my God, I feel like a dinosaur. <laughs> and she sent back a roar. And so, because we are. <laughs> so it was kind of fun to see that uh, and see that again, as Michelle said, and these are her words, the theory lives on. Well, it's not just the theory that lives on. It's the living part of it that I'm, I'm interested in and focused on. Now, where does Michael Piachowski kick into this whole background? Well, interestingly enough, back in 1996, uh, the Sun Conference was being held in uh, where I was living at the point in time, uh, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, when I was starting my doctoral program. And I had the opportunity, thanks to Jim Delisle, to be tossed into a room, literally alone with Michael Piachowski, to have a conversation. And we sat and talked, and it was really awkward, because Michael never really comes out and starts conversations. He'll sit thoughtfully and look at you. And he gives you that stare. <laughs> where it's, it's a very calm stare, but it's a really intense stare. So I really had to game up and lean in and start talking about uh, OEs and Dabrowski's work and what I was learning. And I was, I was a total newbie looking at gifted education and, and getting into what the OEs were. Um, Michael was doing a master class for us at Kent State University and I was working my PhD uh, at that point in time. And this culminating experience where I got to sit and talk to him, I kept telling him there's something missing in this theory and how it's being presented. And I can't put my finger on it. You need to tell me what it is. And, and he pulled his perfect Michael, he crossed his legs, put his hand to his chin, looked at me and went, figure it out. And here we are more than a quarter century later, and I have yet to figure it out, but there is something missing. Uh, I've learned over this period of time a much more um, intense granular approach as to what it means to be living TPD rather than understanding the theory. It, it's very complex. Um, so this idea of figuring it out really leads me to what this presentation today is all about. How do you, as a teacher, rather than a therapist, rather than a clinician, although I, I can do all of that work too. I see myself more of a coach, but I am a teacher by training. How do you as a teacher help other people start on a pathway to self-discovery and to developmental growth? And for those of you that are um, ed psychologists out there, I'm gonna blow up a lot of uh, the background and training. And I did ask Frank about this. Well, how would you um, change the world if you were going to try and get people to uh, understand more. And he said, well, like Chris is going to do these little, little sessions um, and getting people together. I totally disagree with that. Because until this theory and the ways to approach the theory in presenting bits and pieces of the dynamisms and the conversations and the language, until it goes mainstream and education writ large, we'll never move forward. People will not accept that there is a deeper, different way of being in the world. Uh, they're going to focus on what they, they know, which is the, the bare basics, Maslow's hierarchy to one degree, and worse yet, 
Bloom's taxonomy of objectives, which is that just makes, you know, there's a pyramid. It's not a pyramid, it's a circle because you can't have evaluation uh, unless it's connected to knowledge and you can't understand knowledge unless you're able to evaluate. So when I bring that up, my students uh, that I work with get really disconcerted because they're like, well, you have to memorize this like this. It's like, yeah, you do, but it's, it's more complex than that, just as is TPD theory. So today is about auto psychotherapy. And I'm going to share with you what I do. Um, but having to listen to Elena, I guess we move on to, I really can't say anything to top that last session. <laughs> when you have individuals sharing their lives uh, in such an open forum, and I've heard that through the course of the sessions, what more can I say? I'm just a teacher. I'm just doing what I do. So ta-da, questions? I'm kidding. <laughs> I have plenty of more stuff to do. I just wanted to throw that in there for a little bit of comic relief. This says psychoneurosis. And what I want you to realize is the vast majority of the world looks at this word, as this term, and understands it from the perspective of deficits. So, oh, if you have psychoneurosis, there's something wrong with you. You're broken. You need to be fixed. This is the external viewpoint that is often dumped onto people who have no intents or purposes of wanting to be seen as broken in the world, yet the rest of the world will look at them as broken. And I'm talking about highly profoundly gifted. Uh, uh, I've been very fortunate over the years to have uh, worked with the Davidson Institute and the Davidson Academy. And again, this is another thing I don't share very often because I'm, I'm very attuned to uh, what I'm gonna call straight up voyeurism. And that is what many academics do is they will take stories from other people and they will post those up. They will publish off of those and they will share that information. Uh, when Jan Davidson and I talked uh, originally when she was having some difficulty with the academy when it first was instituted. We talked about uh, full disclosure and she wanted to be fair with me that I'd be able to publish off of the work that I was going to start doing. Da, da, da. And I told her, no, I won't do that because this to me is sacred space for these families who are traveling from around the world to try to find a setting where their children can be educated. And we're talking about highly profoundly gifted kids who don't fit into regular public school settings because of a myriad of depths that they have, including a lot of the intensities, but by far the emotional overexcitability. Their parents have it too, by the way. So you get them all in the same room and, oh, it's, it's dynamite. It's fun to sit back and watch. You kind of poke at one or another and just sit back and get your popcorn going. But I told Jan, I, I will never publish off of any of the work that I, I did there. And this goes back to the beginning of the Academy. Um, Colleen Harson and myself and Jan redesigned the curriculum. And this I see is, uh, and I'll talk curricularly, this was my one opportunity in my lifetime to do something different in education. We've envisioned this school to be nothing like anything that existed anywhere else in the world. Uh, and my biggest concern was we were going to come up with something that already exists because that's what we were used to. And that is very common if you're working with individuals and say, the world's your oyster. You can make anything you want to do. What do you do? You tend to make what you're comfortable with or what you're familiar with. You don't take that innovative, creative jump or leap of faith. But we did there and we developed personalized learning pathways and students that come into the academy and they're, and they're live and they've now moved into a virtual space as well. But individual students are part and parcel of developing their own personalized learning plan. So they tell us what their interests are and then we help them figure out if those interests can turn into passions. And if those passions are something that sticks with them. And by the way, passions are, you know, interests come and go, passions stay and absorb you. So, our job is not um, talent development. I do not believe in talent development. Uh, that was one of the worst changes in our field that was hammered down our throats, uh, which means now that my candidacy for the deanship at Northwestern is probably out the window, right? Because that's where Paula O.K. is. But to me, that, that it's a terrible approach that diminishes people. To me, it's about giving people the space to be 
and giving them input and seeing where they go and being there in a supportive manner. Now my gift of grandma's on my shoulder, just going, good for you, Bobby, keep talking. Uh, and I'm talking about Anna Marie because it needs to be very much focused on the individual needs. And that's what we did at Davidson Academy. And it continues to this day. I'm, I'm very happy to say, yes, we developed the school and I'm always on retainer for them if they need me. They haven't needed me in the last 12 years. And I love every minute of that. That means we've done something that has turned into its own and grown into something that we would have never imagined it to be. And it continues to this day. So I personally, Linda talks about this, you know, the amount of um, highly profoundly gifted individuals they've worked with. I personally have worked with 1,750 highly profoundly gifted individuals around the world. Uh, so the stories are there. Uh, the background is there. I constantly use the interactions that I have with these individuals to, to reframe how I think and who I am. I'm one of them too. And I found my peeps. So it wasn't like I had to learn a whole lot of stuff. This is just me uncovering who I am. And many of you have gone through this process and are going through it right now in this self-discovery. So when I talk about living TPD, that, that's who I am. Uh, I don't have a choice. This is who I am 24 seven. I can't turn it on, I can't turn it off. I hide it as much as I possibly can to fit in, but it's there. It's the undercurrent of my being uh, and it, it moves me in different ways. So this idea of psychoneuroses, I have a lot of them. My wife will get a test of that. <laughs> ones that I would identify and ones that she would say, oh God, yeah, <laughs> and build off of that. But if we're looking at this psychologically, the idea of psychoneurosis is it's a minor psychological dis order, what I call a nudge. It's a little nudge, a little birdie that speaks into your ear or pushes a button that causes our capacity as individuals to change and move in different directions. These things can be positive as well as negative. So being identified with a psychoneurosis, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing and you're broken and you need to be fixed. It can be positive and there are many positive psychoneuroses, like in an internal locus of control. One of the most difficult but important components of being an individual is developing the harder external or exoskeleton skin and following your bliss, following your passions, turning your interests into something more and seeing where they go. So that's the positive side. On the negative side, the counter of this is the external locus, seeking the quickest answer, having no control and being pressured to conform all the time. And this is going to lead into what I'm going to present a little bit further, further along in the presentation. But to me, this is all about trying to understand and develop in other individuals through nudges that I can try to do the idea of pertaining, taking responsibility and ownership for not only your life, but your actions, your behaviors, your tendencies. So let's look at a little bit of Dorosky's language from 1964. The propensity for changing one's internal environment and the ability to influence positively the external environment indicate the capacity of individual to develop. Makes perfect sense to me. If you have an internal locus of control, if you're if you are driven by an external locus of control, you read this sentence and go, I I don't get it, doesn't register. How could this be? Well, it's because we're not in a state of B, we're in a state of becoming. So psychoneurosis to me is a positive state of mind, is something that we need to try to help other people understand. You're not broken, you're just different. And different is really cool because you bring a lot to the table that other people don't, if you're willing to share and they're willing to hear you out. This is personality development, dimension three, if you wanna call it that, looking at Dabrowski's theory, uh, where we're moving in the levels. I like to deal with the, the five levels and, and Michelle Kane was talking about that, you know, how, well, why not level five? Well, we can get to level five, but we have to move from level one up. We have to keep moving up, moving up. To me, this idea of personality development is all about moving level two to level three when self-reflection begins and then finding ways to stay integrated without being pushed by external uh, 
states of mind or external expectations and perfectionism. And yeah, this, this is the one piece that I'll, I'll disagree a lot um, with some of the inferences that people are drawing from Dabrowski's level five. It's not a, a state of seeking perfection. Uh, if we're trying to seek perfection, we are destined to fail always. We can never be perfect. That only happens after we move beyond. So striving to be perfect is the downfall of gifted individuals. It always will be because you're, you're giving up your internal locus of control and focusing on something externally imposed and seeking that external um, resolute notice that, oh, look, you're perfect. We can't be perfect. We're fallible, always. You might as well just own it. We screw up all the time. I screw up every day. Happens all the time. I, but I own it. I take responsibility for it. And if I mess something up and it needs to be fixed, I fix it or I find ways to, to overcome it. So this idea of moving, uh, this idea of flowing, this idea of psychoneurosis is all about trying to help people reach level four, where the dynamisms of self-awareness, choice, what's called third factor, and auto -psych psychotherapy kick in. Now, I don't want to get caught up in the terminology, um, although I can play there if we want to. We want to play in that space. I'd much rather get into the application of it. So let's kick this forward a little bit more and then get into uh, how I apply this very um, recently. Given a definition of mental health as a development of the personality, we can say that all individuals who present active development in the direction of a higher level of personality are mentally healthy. This is personality development through Dabrowski's words. Dimension three, this does not mean, however, socially or societally positive values or outcomes. You can be evil and still be mentally healthy. And that is another component that individuals have a difficult time understanding. Uh, the orange pumpkin, pretty much as the story goes on, is going to be deemed as being an evil narcissist, a uh, psychopathic personality. Uh, we have examples of this historically. Uh, Hitler was mentally very sound and very healthy in how he took over responsibility for Germany and steered people into belief sets uh, that they never thought that they would go down that pathway. We're facing that in our country right now. We are in an existential dilemma right now in the United States with what's happening. Um, and it's, it's difficult to be in this space. I, I'll tell you quite honestly, from where I am, it's, it's really difficult and we're seeing that more on in a bit. Spin this up to reality and what's happening outside in the real world. I read in the New York Times a piece by Hayden Twenge uh, that popped out in, in 2021. It was an editorial about the smartphone and this smartphone dilemma. And what they talked about was a smartphone brought about a planetary rewiring of human er interaction. As smartphones became common, they transformed peer relationships, family relationships, and the texture of daily life for everyone. Now, as an educator, uh, I see this happening and I see the impact and outcome of this happening. Teachers, uh, I'm a teacher trainer, and trying to help train pre-service teachers to go out and be effective in the classroom has changed dramatically in the last dozen years. Students, unless they're being highly entertained, turn you off. And their attention spans, I'm talking about students, is becoming less and less to the point where it's non-existent anymore. Now, Hayden Twenge based this comment about smartphones uh, and realization about smartphones, which is becoming much more focused now. Others uh, across the spectrum are starting to identify this as a major problem that's changing humanity around the world. But they based this on a study that they did exploring the concept of loneliness. They were looking at adolescent loneliness and how has it changed over time. Uh, their original study was run in 2021 and it was uh, published in the Journal of Adolescence. Uh, and if you're interested in that, I can give you uh, the direct connection to that. Uh, but I, again, I picked this up in an editorial and I thought, oh, well, perfect. I'm working now with honor students who are freshmen coming to the University of Toledo. And one of the things I want them to do is feel uncomfortable in their own skins, but also safe. So what a better place for trying to get freshmen engaged than helping them understand that smartphones have a tendency to take over and rule your life. 
And many students are going into pretty high, high caliber, high profile career pathways where the coursework is really difficult. And unless they're able to really focus and study, they're going to get into some difficulties. So when I try to tell them, here are some study skills, and they go, oh, yeah, I, we can find anything online. It's like, yeah, you can, but is it anything that's any good? Now, what I found that the idea in thinking about this, the smartphone changing the planetary rewiring human interaction meant that now we have uh, what I'm going to call dissociative conflict without reintegration. And inverted model of TPD. And, I'm, and as I started to theorize this and think about it and write about it and put notes down on paper, I'm seeing it more and more and more. So something has to be done. I had to, to choose to do something. But before we get there, I want to lay out a couple of truth claims. First of all, this is the Cleavers, for those of you that don't know this, Beaver Cleaver and his family back from 1950s TV. And what 1950s TV, it showed a nuclear family. So you had mom and dad and mom always had pearls on. And when dad came home from work, mom was there to meet him at the door with her, his drink and his pipe or his cigar. And she was in the kitchen, perfectly dressed with an apron on cooking dinner for the children who would then come in and do whatever. So this um, nuclear family, if you wanna call it that, was the model that was put on television. And people wanted to follow this model. Uh, that's called a simulacrum. Uh, and what this means is this is the exact copy of something that never existed. You think, wow, that was going on. They were brainwashing people in the 1950s with television. Yeah, it's called social engineering. It happens today too, by the way. Uh, Students uh, and individuals, we watch television and we see hairstyles and we see that, you know, right now, a lot of uh, the way people are dressing is going back to the 70s and 80s. I keep thinking, man, if I would have kept my old wardrobe, whew, we'd be selling stuff and paying for the kids' college education online right now. But we're driven by what we see. So the visual representation drives what we see. This is the simulacrum. We want to be what often has never existed. People want to be rich and famous, like movie stars. Well, movie stars, it's all about the facade. It's not about reality. They're playing a role. They're playing a part. Virtually, through space like we're in right now, you know, you see me, right? I have, I have a suit on. But do I? Do I even have pants on? Can you tell? I may not. Truth be told, I do have pants on. They're shorts, though. I'll show you. They don't match my suit, here they are. So I look professional and I can do this virtually like our students can become avatars online and they cannot show their true self. They can feel like frauds and be someone completely different online versus who they are in real life or in three-dimensional life where people are interacting. Imposter syndrome is alive and well and flourishing. It's often seen as something that, well, we, you know, we need to help people overcome this. People live this all the time now. Online, he who screams or she who screams the loudest wins for the most part, right? You have trolls that are doing nothing but bashing others all the time based on the big E, emotions. And I'm not saying that everyone out there has emotional overexcitabilities, but emotions are, are ruling the decisions that people are making or not making and not giving people the time, energy, or space to think and respond. You have to get back quick or you're shut down. And this is having a, a diabolical negative effect on children in schools because of what's happening in social settings or social media, if you want to call it social media, I, it's a social media um, because bad things are being done to kids, especially a lot of bullying. And that's not being recognized by parents or by educators and nothing's being done about it. So we have this identical copy for something which never existed, a simulacrum. It's now moved to the virtual space. So we're not even visually seeing this anymore. It's just happening. Uh, on television, you would see it. And you only had a certain amount of channels. And when the channels went off at night, usually around 1130, that was it, TV was off. You got that little pattern that's a test pattern and 
have a nice night, and that was it. We're in a 24-7 cycle now. Everything's available all the time for everyone. So let's talk a little bit about philosophy. And one of my friends, Donna Ambrose, keeps telling me that, you know, you know, Bob, you're the gifted and talented philosopher du jour. <laughs> and I said, no, that's Virgil Ward. And he said, ah, no, not anymore. Uh, you need to start picking this up and running with it. And I find that it's difficult to talk about philosophy in our field because our field is filled with psychologists who want to measure everything. And philosophy is about measuring nothing and realizing that that's where the important work is done, not in, in measuring little tidbits and then putting it out and saying, well, this is what we need to do because we measured this little tidbit. Au contraire, we don't know enough to be able to put out information that says, this is what we need to do. We need to learn more. So in philosophy, there are three, three mantra, I'll call them mantra or ways of thinking, that it's the nature of knowing. And these are developmental the nature of being, and the nature of values and valuing. If we follow TPD theory, the nature of knowing is when we're at level one, learning the ropes, being uh, socialized into our family setting, socialized into our community. The nature of being is when you move to school and you're starting to break apart a little bit the family dynamic and developing your own personality to a small degree when you go to school and you need to fit in. So there's some trauma that happens there, some uh, disintegration and then reintegration. You reach your adolescent years and mom and dad or whoever's caregivers at home are pretty distraught because you become very moody. You sleep until one in the afternoon. You don't get up and do anything. Um, you're constantly irritable. You look weird because your arms are real long, your legs are real long, and you're a string bean because of all the hormonal growth and everything that's going on. Um, and it's, it's who you are, you're being, you're trying to find your space. And then all of the desires of the sensual domain kick in and, and holy cow, all bets are off. And then we move eventually to a state where we start to understand our values. And some of them are, were plugged into us by our parents and the expectations of people around us and, and this idea of valuing what we're doing. That happens later in life. So these are developmental. They do follow the pathway of, of level one through level four. If you follow that, I only have three of them listed here, right? But this idea is we want people to try to move from being to becoming, but we need to be and become, which is why I have that bit down at the bottom. So Patty and Linda, I know, spoke on Tuesday about honoring your five dimensions. These are my words. It wasn't really Linda. Linda was backing up what Patty was saying, being tip, you know, being very Linda-like. Patty had all the information. Linda just said, yeah, you're right. Go, boom, and threw Patty right back under the bus and to go on from there. But these idea of the dimensions, uh, my words, right, of the dimensions, who you are as a being and your being, understanding your being is important. We know so precious little about cognitive or affective development, let alone the two of them combined that it's, it's very troubling when people have answers and have the fix to problems. We don't even understand the questions. <laughs> We're not asking the right questions yet. And by the way, neuropsych is a nice visual exercise. Seeing the diagrams light up is really cool. That's the whiz bang piece of it. But I'm gonna tell you, you disconnect that brain from the heart, nothing lights up anymore. That's a Schultzism, and I've been saying that for years and years and years. So I'm not a big fan of neuropsychology, although a lot of my students that are coming in as honor students are going, I'm going into neuropsych. And that's like, why? Why don't you become an artist? You paint pictures there too, and you don't have to use that fancy MRI and pay all that money to get it fired up, right? And they look at me like I have two heads, but you know, that's my job. I want to push them so they're, they're off kilter a little bit. I'm not bashing the work of neuropsychology. We are finding out lots of intricate information, like the emotions exist in the white matter of the brain, not the gray matter. Now, I intuitively kind of knew that already because that's the all-encompassing component of the brain. So it makes sense that we'd find that some way, somehow. Uh, I'm wondering if we're only finding what we expect to find, though. And what are the limitations based on the electronics that we're working with? Uh, it's, it's interesting to think about those things. But again, that's, I digress, being a philosopher. Uh, I want to get at the, 
the picture of what we're trying to do now and how I'm trying to lead you on this pathway what an educator does. So back from philosophy to another truth claim. Um, a pastiche is a meme. You know them as memes online now. Uh, these are where what is real is constantly under question. And there's a difference between truth with a big T, which is all enduring, and truth with a small T. Small, tr small T truth are claims that people make. I always wonder how many memes does it take to be real? Almost as if I have saw this happening and you've all experienced it too over the last several years, how many times does a lie need to be told before it becomes the truth? And we're facing a very large component of the American population that's been told multiple lies multiple times. They believe it now. How do we battle this pasty? How do we move backwards? How do we get past this? How do we help people develop? Again, Hayden Twenge, by 2012, as the world now knows, the major platforms had created an outrage machine, and I'm talking about social media, that made life online far uglier, faster, more polarized, and more likely to incite performative shaming. This happened by 2012. Well, this is 10 years later, and we're seeing over and over again uh, a lot of the negative connotations and output. We're in the Wild West when it comes to social media. What happened in the Wild West was eventually the government started to pass laws and took control of everyone having a gun. Uh, I, I think we're, we're going backwards in so many ways, right? Now everyone wants to arm teachers and give teachers guns in classrooms, and that'll help solve problems. No, more guns isn't going to help. Better control and focus and being more citizenly like is more important. Again, this is the big E. Emotional responses outpace thoughtful engagement. Truth with a small T becomes truth with a big T if no one pushes back. But it's difficult to push back, right? Because you have to take a risk. So we as a society, and you've seen this, uh, we're addicted to smartphones and technology. We have all the indicators of pure addiction. Psychologically, every one of us could be identified as being addicted to smartphones or devices. You've seen this when you've gone out to dinner, when if you're able to go out to dinner and eat in restaurants. Uh, I'm unable to do that at this point in time, but you see this observing families out for dinner. They're not talking across the table or even two people out on a date. They're on their phones. Sometimes they're texting each other right in the same room. What is reality? Is it not in the eyes of the beholder? So the distinction between real and online reality is starting to blur more and more. What about online is real? How can you be sure? Aren't we living in a simulacrum or hoping for something that never existed to be there? Or is it more of a pastiche where it's a representation of who we are, but we don't know we're being steered down a pathway? Hello, life calling. Highly stressful circumstances may lead to negative disintegration or chronic psychosis in the negative way. This is what I call the inverted TPD model. And that's Dabrowski. I know some of you know that already. That's, that's not me in an elder version that I've now recome back. But I've talked about an inverted positive maladjustment. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm living. I've been living this for many years. It's disintegration. People moving from level three where they're fighting for principles are being driven down to level two, having to play by artificial rules set up by somebody else and being driven down to level one of having to do whatever they can to get by. Uh, pulling row away is the ultimate of this. We had Supreme Court justices sit before Congress and lie through their freaking teeth about what they were going to do so they could get that job. Talk about the ultimate of self-serving motives, level one thinking, psychopaths. We are now under the rule of psychopaths. And what recourse do we have if we're at level two or level three? 
we can't play by the rules anymore because the rules are off the window. What do we have to do? We have to vote. We keep hearing that over and over again, right? Will the midterms change anything? Myself, I'm going to say no, they're not. Because we're only going to be messing with the deck chairs on the boat. We're not turning this Titanic around at this point in time. It's going to come down to a literal dogfight. And that's going to be problematic. So this idea of fighting for principles, there are many people that are, are trying to fight the good fight. And they're trying to pull people who are playing by the rules up with them. So we, we're having a lot of this inverted positive maladjustment happening, very cyclical, very flow-like. Who's the weakest link? When we're being pulled down by the, I forget what Hillary Clinton called, Clinton called this group of individuals. Um, one of you probably remembers the word, but I'm gonna say miscreants, the miscreants in our society. The people who were always under a rock and held at bay because they were scared to, to voice uh, some of their beliefs. When they're out proud uh, pushing white supremacy and racism and taking away rights from people and saying, well, this is the way Jesus lived. No, he didn't. <laughs> Uh, he didn't. There are lots of different ways to look at religiosity and understand it differently. And we need to respect that. That's part of our, our upbringing and morals. Um, but people are getting past that. They're pushing hard down this pathway. So how do we fight this inverted positive maladjustment? Can we do something about it? Yes, we can. And I'm going to move to a bit of the work of Paulo Freire. And in 1988, uh, in a book written by Henry Giroux, it's an introduction to a, a tome that he put together. Um, it was an edited version, but teachers as intellectuals. Frere wrote in the introduction, one of the tasks of the progressive educator through a serious, correct political analysis is to unveil opportunities for hope, no matter what the obstacles may be. After all, without hope, there's little we can do. We are living in these times. This was 40 years ago. To me, it's as fresh as if Frere was here and wrote it today. I've written about passionate hopefulness, and this goes back, uh, you know, I'm showing my age and my history here, but back in 2002, 20 years ago, I wrote a piece on passionate hopefulness that was uh, published through, NAG, through NAGC, through Conceptual Foundations, and it really framed out my thoughts about how to be living a TPD life and how to become moving forward. It's framed by the sense of prayer's rationale for hope. Uh, my work in exploring the interests of, well, the idea of interests moving to passions and then agency doing something to help instill that process or, or move that process along. It's also taking time to calm down, to slow down, to be more deliberate and to talk to other people deliberation, to be introspective before choosing to take action. Third factor, right? So builds up the third factor. It's internal drive based on your core values, being and becoming. So trying to initiate the process of moving to level four. But again, I don't want to be caught up in the theory. I want to live the life and help people understand in language that they can use. I want to meet people where they are. I use bibliotherapy to do this. It's clinical. It's also developmental. Uh, now, this is a really interesting book. Jenny O'Dell wrote this book, and it was New York Times bestseller list. Uh, and it was referred to me by one of my friends who teaches um, in one of the private Ivies. And she made her students read it, and they hated it. And I said, oh, perfect. That's exactly what I want my students to read, <laughs> something that they'll hate. And we found that the book, book kind of gets long-winded, uh, but chapter one is stellar. It's stellar. It's called Doing Nothing is Hard. And in chapter one, Odell talks about this idea of smartphones and how they're, they've changed our lives and it fit this hate and twangy model. Perfect. So it's like a match made in heaven, if you will. Uh, and what I said, all right, the smartphone trap, I posted up in a discussion board for my students to read the editorial. And then I had them read 
how to do nothing, chapter one. And then we put it into practice. I, I said, we're going to do an experiment. And it's an experiment that I've done on and off for the last 20 years with students in classrooms at various levels that I teach, whether it be in public schools or even teacher education or all the way through the doctoral level. And that is, I tell people, we're going to do an experiment where you put down your cell phone. And when I first started doing this, I made the, the assignment be for a day. So they had to shut down their cell phones for a day. And the day was defined as a period of time from when you wake up in the morning until you're ready to go to bed at night. That's your day, whether it's 12 hours, okay. If you're really addicted, it's four hours, you get up, you're only gonna stay up four hours, then you're gonna take a nap and go to sleep and you're gonna use that as your frame. Okay, I, I let people do that. I found that people were having a major difficult time setting aside their addiction and recognizing how addicted they were. And I, I would have them journal about it and write about it. And we'd talk about it in class. Now, over, over the years, I have been unable to do anything longer than five minutes. And five minutes is trauma for individuals. You may want to try this tonight. And I don't mean when you go to bed, turn your cell phone off. Take a five-minute period of time and turn your cell phone off and see what happens to you. You'll start to show all the signs of addiction. You'll start to twitch. You'll start to get nervous. You'll constantly be looking for it, wondering where you left it. And it'll be very problematic. So I do this, and, and I still do this to this day. Five minutes, put it down. And then I have students write. And I tell them, write how this made you feel. Write how Odell's chapter now has changed in your perception after you did this experiment. Write in a way that you can share with other people in our class because everyone's going to do this activity. Oh, and by the way, I play too. So there's not a teacher that's writing heard over everyone. I do all the activities with the students because I want the space that we establish to be a trustworthy space. They can trust me to be very authentic and I want them to be authentic. So this is what I do through bibliotherapy, through clinical and I'll call it clinical because I'm reorgan reorganizing their uh, locus of control and attachment by switching it from an external locus to forcibly having them take ownership in an internal way and being introspective. So I'm pushing them into some of the dynamisms without naming them, but I'm forcing their hand. It's uncomfortable. They don't like it when they're writing about it. And they're very good at sharing that when we have discussion. And you know, I tell them, you're going to write, and then we're going to share. You don't have to read everything you wrote, but I want you to share, and then we're going to have a discussion. And every one of them complains about this and says, how could you make us do this? This is terrible. I, I, it, it's horrible. We have to have these devices. So listen to yourselves. So know how addicted you are. And they, they go, we're not addicted. It's like, you're not, really? Look at what you've written. I'm not going to read it. You look at what you wrote and tell me you're not addicted. And then I share with them definitions of addiction. <laughs> and that then hammers at home. They've had the experience. Uh, so clinically, this idea of recalibrating to an internal locus of control is something that um, you're only able to do if people are open to being in that space. And it takes trust. Uh, to me, it's also developmental agency. I want them to start putting responsibility and ownership into action. It's not enough just to be reflective and sit back and wait for me, the teacher, to tell them, okay, I did this, now what's the next thing? And by the way, do I get my points for doing that activity? No, I want you to do something about it. So the next step is, I ask them, how would you change your addiction to become unaddicted to smartphones? And by the way, think about your younger brother or sister, or if you're going into education, you're going to be a teacher. Are you going to face this addiction in your classroom space or your setting? How do the adults in that setting deal with this issue? Can they deal with this issue? And we move on through that. It, it's really interesting to see what the students do. So what I'm doing in that process is putting them into a space where they have to go through and undergo auto psychotherapy. They get an experience, they become reflective about the experience, they understand that they didn't like the experience when they were going through it, but it's an aha. I've uncovered some of their internal core belief sets, which we hide and we encapsulate in armor. 
and I've done this in a space that is uh, open. I share, I often go first and I share the discomfort that I have that makes it okay then to say that, well, it's uncomfortable for him. It was, it's, it's okay for me to say it's uncomfortable for me. To me, uh, this is all about humans being, not human beings. And I, I change that language anytime I use it. Um, and coming out of a biological sciences background, it's been difficult for me to do that. But humans being is what we're in right now. This is all about agency in a small personal way. Making a risk happen, but not a huge one. It's not taking a risk. It's making a risk happen. There's a difference there. This is about focusing on self and then projecting that to others. It's positive maladjustment, going through a state of disintegration and then reintegration with support through the auto-psychological approach, through bibliotherapy, through, through having these mechanisms they can grab onto. Uh, and it incorporates a lot of the dynamisms. Now, I see the dynamisms a little bit differently. I see this as a nebula. These aren't individual things that stack. They're, they're intermixed. Uh, they're myriad of interaction points or what I call nodes. And this entire nebula is constantly in motion. So all I'm doing is walking into the river, so to speak, at a per particular period in time, sampling what's happening there. And I'm never gonna be able to walk back into that space again and see, be in the same place. It's always gonna be dynamic and changing. So through this process, and this is just one activity. I have many, many of these activities, but this is one that I found very currently is having major play. And I feel free to steal this. Uh, not that I'm I'm pushing Odell's book to make more sales for her. She will not give me a cut, I'm sure, of any anything gets sold. But if you want to try this, this is a this is a very dynamic process to start with, and it's safe. People will recognize that yes, they are addicted to their phones. Uh, we all are. <laughs> it's pretty easy to see that, but. Moving from this maladaptive state to a positive maladjustment state, uh, this starts that process. Having people understand through auto psychotherapy that they do have some control. It may not be a ton in what's going on around them, but they can choose to set their cell phone down, third factor, right? They can choose that choice. Once you start taking responsibility and ownership for your actions, you start moving positively toward multi-level disintegration. Now we're being driven right now societally in the States and around the world by a lot of external issues. I, I, I'm, I can't even come up with the right word, but we have a pandemic that's still in place. We have a lot of social unrest, uh, social disintegration, maladaptive social disintegration. We have the wrong people in the wrong places doing the wrong things every day. And pretending like they're doing nothing but what their constituents say, and they're not. So how do we move past that? Well, we have to start looking again at where people are developmentally and helping them grow by level. And if people are in self-serving motives at level one, which a lot of people are being driven down toward, how do we help them move forward? The biggest piece to this is understanding the complexity and giving people opportunity to be reflective, taking responsibility and ownership for something, contributing to their local environment. And that can be your family, doing something for your family, doing something for your sibling, doing something for your mother or father. It can be engaging with the community a little bit broader, uh, going outside and picking up trash at the park. Where I live, there's an issue with you're supposed to uh, carry around doggy bag, doggy poo bags and pick up after your dogs. A lot of people don't do that. So some of us in the neighborhood will go out and pick up after other people. And it it's disgusting, yes, but it gives you a sense of worth and value. And those little pieces start us on that positive path toward passion and hopefulness. That's the direction that's going to save us, finding hope, moving toward it, helping people rise to level four, which is fully capable. People are fully capable of getting there. And, and the good news is once you move uh, past level three development toward personality, which begins at level four, there is no regression back down. Once you're at level four, you look at the other levels. It's almost as if you've moved to a different branch in the tree. 
and you're able to look down on the other branches and say, oh yeah, we have a lot of stuff going on here. I don't want to go play there anymore. How can I help bring people with me? And this is the idea of level four. You're developing your personality and then moving toward level five, um, but there's no regression back down unless there's a traumatic brain injury or a major environmental shift that happens that, that really knocks you out of kilter. And again, you fall back into the process and we can move through it again. But this idea of being and becoming, emphasis is on becoming, moving positively, passionately forward, finding hope and pushing it up. In the presentation deck, which you'll have available, here's the handouts, uh, or I'm sorry, here's the references and the bibliography that I've used if you wanna dig into some of these pieces yourself. Uh, the Hayton Twenge piece is, on the New York Times website, I did take a look today and it's still there. Um, Odell's book is still out, 2019. I will use it again this fall. And if you wanna look back historically at the, the piece that I wrote about passion and hopefulness, there it is, Conceptual Foundations back in 2002. There's me, uh, there's how to get a hold of me with my email address and my telephone. Uh, my phone will take you to voicemail and then voicemail sends an email to me, but I'm, I'm happy to, to communicate with people if they wanna see a little bit more. And again, you have these slides if you wanna dig in or ask me questions about how I um, do these sorts of things in the classroom. I know I went through it pretty quick, but I wanna give you that space to be able to answer or ask questions, which I think I did leave some time for you, yeah, 45 minutes on the, on the docket here. So I'm gonna kick off my screen share. Um,